Okay, Boker Tov. Today's staff is Mem Aleph, 41. We pick up at the bottom of Mem Amit Pet, and, um, uh, and we, we're dealing with a number of statements in the name of Shmuel about what are the requirements for, like, a motive of Miktsas, um, and if somebody demands Chitim and Sorim and only admits to and, and admits to the Sorim, is that considered Mimin Hatana or not Mimin Hatana? Okay, now we pick up with. Um, uh, Amar of Anan Amar Shmuel. It is about, oh, I don't know, about a good 20 lines before before the bottom. The line starts with the word Rav Anan. It's roughly across from the Tosos Vechada. So Amar of Anan Amar Shmuel, Tano Chiti Vechadam Vahodolo Besaorim. So this guy say, um, you owe me wheat. And he was going to say, and barley. Okay, that was like, you know, and the guy said, no, I don't owe you wheat, I owe you barley. So this is assuming like Shmuel's earlier statement that had he said wheat and barley and the guy admitted to barley, that would have been a motive of mikzas, it would have been mimin hatiana, it would have been of the same type of claim, and he would have had to take a shrua. But if the guy didn't get the words and barley out, the guy just said, you owe me wheat, and he said, no, nope, I owe you barley. So then he became a kofer hakal, right? Or not a kofer hakal, whatever, anyway, he was uh, he didn't admit to anything that was part of the claim. And therefore, he did, he's totally, you know, he he's he would be totally exempt from the shvua. How would we frame that? Would we look at what the guy was going to claim, and then he's this, and then you know, and then this person who responded is the motive of us? Or do we say at the end of the day, the guy just said wheat, that he responded barley, and therefore he doesn't take a shvua? Yeah, we don't know. He would. He may have said something. You don't know if it was the barley. He could have said. Whatever. You know, from the context, we're, that's true. But we're t- assuming the case that we know that that was going to that was true in the context. Okay. So in kimarim chayev. If he's doing it as a scheme, like he, you know, like, and then, you know, then, uh, and he knew that the guy was going to say barley, and he was doing this to prevent the guy from saying barley, then he has to take a shot. Mr. Rabbanan? Well, so that's not clear. Hold on. And But if it's mitkavein, meaning if this is just like, no, like, you know, he was being innocent, and he heard wheat, and he said no barley, then he's exempt. So, of course, the question is, like, where do we, how do we obligate him? Like, what technically is his deal right to obligation? So it could be it's Mr. Rabbanan. Like, technically, you're out of it, but rabbinically, if you, if you, if you manipulated the situation, we're going to impose it on you. It could also be that no, we, we frame the question about what was the ta'ana is not necessarily the question of what came out of this guy's mouth. Meaning, if you knew the guy was going to say barley and you essentially were responding to that, even though he didn't yet say those words, then the ta'ana did include barley. You know, so that could be part of the question, right? What do you define as being part of the Tana might have to do with the context. Um, so that's another way of understanding that. Anyway, so now we continue. Um, okay. So we did that, we discussed this before, although now we're spelling it out, that the idea is Kalim means it, it, that if it's a vessel that's being demanded for the mode of a mikdash, two vessels and you admit to one, it does not have to be a claim worth two pesef. You know, two ma'a, like we've been calling that 20 bucks. It's enough that it's even a vessel, even worth almost nothing. Although Tosa says it does have to be worth the pruta. That's the idea of mm-hmm. chashuv. Yeah. So okay. each ma'a is worth each, the pruta. According to Tosa, each, each, uh, yeah, each uh, needle has to be worth the pruta. So two, two, uh, two needles, and he admitted to one of them. Chayav. That's why Kalim were, st- were st- treated separately as money because it's whatever they are, meaning regardless of their market value. Again, Tosos inserts that they have to be worth at least a put to eat, but two Kalim is enough. Okay. Amarav Papa, Tano Kalim Upruta, Vahoda Vikalim Vichafar Papruta, Pato. Let's say he said, You owe me, um, you know, two needles and a pruta. And he admitted, Yes, I owe you the needles, but I don't owe you the pruta. Then you are exempt. Okay. Hoda pruta, um, yes, I owe you a pruta, but I don't owe you the needles, chayev. Now, what is the logic behind this? So the Gemara spells it very nicely, spells it out for us. Chada kerav, chada kishmuel. One of these assumes a position of Rav, we discussed earlier, and one assumes a position of Shmuel. Chada kishmuel, damar tano chiti misarim v'hoda lovach, I'm sorry, I skipped the line. Chada kerav, damar kfiris ta'anat shtei kesem. That it's not enough that the claim be worth, you know, two, 20 bucks, the what's what's being denied has to be worth twenty bucks, or has to be worth a kli. You know, if we use the kalim model. So in this case, you have you have two kalim and a pruta. Okay, you don't have. You could say the claim was two kalim, right? So that's you know that's fine. The claim was two kalim, but we also need the denial, right? Remember, according to Rav, you need the denial to be worth either the twenty bucks or the two kalim. 
So that's what we're saying here, that the, everybody agrees you have a sufficient claim. The claim was, give me my two needles and my penny. Okay, do you have a sufficient denial? So since one of the examples here was, was that if he admits to the needles and he denies the penny, he's exempt, okay, right? That was the case, right? What was it? Hode Bekelin, Bekafer Bepruta, Patur, that's like Rav. That it's not enough that the claim be the $20 slash two kalim. The, the denial has to be $20 or two kalim. So if you admitted to the penny and denied the two kalim, you had a big enough denial. But if you admitted to the needles and denied the penny, you did not have a big enough denial and therefore you're exempt. Okay, so that's like Rav. Let's say that again. That you need that the, that the denial be two kasef or two kalim. And that's why if you deny the kalim, you're chayv. If you deny the pruta, you're putter. Okay, if you, deny, if you demand two separate types of things and he admitted one, he's chayv. And that's the case where if you admit to the pruta and deny the kalim, so the denial is big enough, it's two kalim. Ah, but you know, but that's the case where like it's two separate things, kalim and a pruta, and you admitted to the pruta, you denied the kalim. That's like chitin and saorim, and you didn't admit it to one of them. So that goes like shmuel that says you're chayv. Nobody explains. Or Rabbi Yochanan argued on Shmuel, but Rav didn't argue on Shmuel. Okay, so the conclusion of the Gemara, which is pretty much where we saw things going anyway, was that the, it's not enough that the claim be a certain size, the denial has to be a certain size, that's Rav, that size is either two Kesef or two Kalim, okay, um, or one Kalim, I guess. Uh, no, two Kalim would be, yeah, two Kalim, according to Rav, so the denial has to be a certain size. But the other thing, which also made a lot of sense, is if you demand Chitin and Saorin, and you can see to Saorin, that's considered motive and mixtas, even though the thing that you are denying, you didn't admit to any part of the chitim, nevertheless, that's a motive of mikatsas. Okay, good. So now we continue. That was a nice way of sort of, of pulling together some of the earlier discussion. All right, now we pick up with the two dots, going back to the Mishnah. Okay, so that's a straight kofar hakol is exempt, and of course everybody reads that and says, wait, 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 you're just totally off. You don't have to do anything. You just totally deny a claim. So that's what the Gemara is going to turn to. Let's take a look. Amar of Nachman. But we do make him swear a shuas hesse. So there's a question what the word hesse means, right? Rashi says it means like seduced, like the, hmm. or like the, the rabbis like sort of persuaded you to make it because really biblically you're not obligated to make it. Okay. Well, I, they, they <laughs> persuade you. You don't have a choice, yeah, I right? know. I know. I understand. <laughs> anyway, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a uh, very, very, what's it called? Like uh, no, strong you offer, you can't refuse. Exactly. Strong darn persuasion. <laughs> not exactly clear. Anyway, what, you know, what exactly the etymology is. But a shvua this has is sort of like a generic shvua that the rabbis instituted. I mean, we're going to see a certain types of shvua durabanans in very specific concrete cases, which are coming up, which is a case of nishbain v'notlin, that I have a claim, like, you know, that you're basically my worker, and you say you haven't paid me today, and I say I did pay you, and da 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 Anyway, and there's something, like, there's a lot of very concrete evidence and circumstances, and then we let you take a shvua and, 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 and take your money. Okay, that's a certain small number of rabbinic shvua of nishbain v'notlin. But basically, that's a, you know that's like a very small number of cases um, in very specific circumstances. But then there's this generic shvua called shvuas hesed, which pretty much is anytime sort of like you know we, we're not exactly sure. I mean, depends. We'll see in a minute the debate about the scope. But it's pretty much a shvua that you can very readily just say, wait, I don't believe you. Take a shvua, shvuas hesed. So whatever you need to back that up, you know, or something. And so there's so this is like becomes a very generic type of a shvua. Although we're about to see in a minute what the circumstances are, um, but mostly again it's a shvua about being exempt. You're making a claim. Uh, it's not a motor mix it's not an edachad, it's not a shvuas hashem. I mean, technically speaking, it's a he said, he said, or whatever, he said, she said, or she said, she said. Anyway, you know, and your claim is just believed. I say you owe me $100. You say, no, you get to walk away. You don't need anything to back it up. But the rabbi said, well, we, we need to back that up a little bit. Okay, and you have to make a shvuas hesis. Okay, so before you walk away. Okay, so the Gemara says, I'm Rabbi Nachman, I should be no so shvuas hesis. Okay, you make him take the shvuas hesis. My timer, chazaka in adam tovea elin king yeshlo. Because if I say you owe me $100, presumably I'm not totally making it up. Meaning if I'm going to force a shua on this guy, right, if the rabbis are going to say this this guy, the defendant has to make a shua, that's probably because there's some basis to suspect that maybe he owes the money. What's the basis? You know, Ruven just came out of nowhere and said, you owe me $100, and Shimon said, you're crazy, I don't. So that's, is that fair that Ruven can make Shimon take a shua? Yes, because Ruven probably would not demand it if there was not, if there was not some basis for it. 
Ah, the rabbi says the Gemara Chazaka in Adam is part of the Snei Bal Chovo. We could say that there's a Chazaka that a person it does not have the temerity to deny a debt, and if he's saying you don't owe me anything, then presumably he's telling the truth. No, Ishtamuta here the Kamishdamit lay. He's just pushing him off. Maybe he really does owe him the debt. Sometimes people really do deny it fully. And then why? So how, how could they do that? That's so such such ingratitude. No, they're not really going to fully deny it. They're just saying for now they're claiming that so that they can get the money together. Okay. Until I get money together, then I'll pay him off. Teda, you should know this is true. The Amarav Idi Bar Havi. This applies, but also like let's say you gave me to watch to Machatim in a pruta. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, it might not be. Okay, Teda. The Amarav Idi Bar Havi. Amarav Chus. The Hakover B'Milva Kasher Leedus. But we cut on puzzle Leedus. If somebody denies that they owed money and then witnesses come and testify the guy was lying, he did borrow the money. He still could be a kosher aid. Whereas if somebody denied that he was watching a object for somebody and witnesses say, you know what, you never gave me your iPhone to watch. And then witnesses say, what are you, what are you talking about? We saw him put it in his knapsack just a minute ago, you know, your iPhone and so on. So then he cannot be an aide. What's the difference? Because in the first case, we say that his denial, no, it's not a denial, but shurua. It was just, I say, where is it? And you denied it. So in one case, that denial doesn't really mean you're a real liar in the first case. It's, I mean, it, it means you're just pushing me off, but it's, well, you did lie, but you didn't lie, but you didn't lie to the, with the extent of, to, to the, with the intent of keeping something that wasn't yours. It was just a way of pushing me off to stop nudging you for the hundred dollars, like, I, you know, and in order to buy your yourself some time. Whereas in the case of an object, if you actually have my object, why are you not giving it back? Okay? And the fact that you're saying you don't have it when you do have it, uh, if it got lost or broken or whatever, we're back to see, then maybe you're lying in order to find it or in order to pay me back for it. That's a different story. But if you have it in your knapsack and you're saying you don't have it, it must be you're intending to steal it. So it's interesting. If somebody is known to have lied in the context of this back and forth, that doesn't make him puzzled Avis. Could you imagine that? Anytime you bring testimony that somebody once lied in their life so they couldn't be a witness, nobody would ever be a witness. Okay? So therefore, like these types of lies that are not really with the intent to steal um, are not enough to invalidate somebody as a witness. Okay? And that's the first case. But the second case, we define it as with the intent to steal and it doesn't validate. Um, Rav Chaviv now. Um, uh, so therefore, right. anyway, so based on that distinction, we're saying that if I come and say you owe me $100 and you say, no, I don't, you know, we're a little concerned that I might be telling the truth because I wouldn't stop make that up out of nowhere. You might deny it even though it's true. And that doesn't mean you're a bad guy. It might just mean you're buying time. But I probably wouldn't demand it if there was nothing behind it. So that enough makes us see that there's enough validity to ha ask, have you make a shrua? Yes. Yeah, well, so what happens to the creditor? Is he allowed to bring the guy to court again later on? Say, you do owe me that money? And, I mean, uh, uh, what do the, you mean? In other words, the person who borrowed the money, he's denying it because right. he wants to gain time, right? Right. So, so um, we make he, could make also, he could also just forget the whole thing and decide, well, I'm not paying him now. You know what well, I mean? that's why exactly we make, make a sure. Oh, okay. okay. You, I say you owe me the hundred dollars. You say you don't. We say, well, we think Dove is, there's, there's a, we're a little concerned Dove is telling the truth because we can understand Dove wouldn't make that up out of nowhere, but you know, David might deny it just to buy himself time. So how are we going to get to the bottom of this? So rather than just saying David gets to walk off, which is what the Mishnah says, call for a call, you get to walk off. We're going to say, you know what, before we let David walk off, we're going to make him make a shrub. And that's exactly what Rav Nachman is saying. And I might hesitate to make And you it. might say, no, I'm not going to make a shrub. I'll pay you instead. Uh -huh. but the, which is going to be a good scheme on your part. Right, but the thing is, and, and we're sure. about to see, the principle is the principle of if you're not able to make a sure you have to pay. Is that really uh, um, uh, true, you know, in um, by what do you call it, by this rabbinic shua? That's true by a right to shua. So, you know, one possibility is, is that you'll make a shua and we'll, th then our misgivings will be set aside. You made a shua, now we believe more that you're telling the truth, right? The other question is, is that you say, I don't want to make a shua. So what's the consequence of refu refusing to make a shua by a shua's hesses? You know, right? you know, presumably it would be, you know, it, it would, it, on, it, on the one hand, it's not a weighty shua de right? so, so maybe you don't have to pay because we don't really, like in a heavy way, think you owe the money in a concerned way. We work for maybe you owe the money. So is that enough to say you have to pay? So it's not clear. Well, the shua says well, the is then that everybody goes ahead and says, oh, so David said he didn't owe the money, but then you wouldn't go ahead and make the sure. You know, maybe there's like some social pressure in that. It's not exactly clear, right, what is the consequence of you not making the sure. Let's hold off. We're going to have that somewhat of that discussion. And so it up. doesn't have that metaphysical effect that we're talking about. 
time yesterday with those heavy. Well, heavy that's clothes. a good question too, because whatever the nature of the obligation is, if it's a shuas sheker, then it yeah, still is a shuas sheker, right? It doesn't almost matter whether where the obligation is coming from. You're still taking an oath about something that is false. Okay, so you might have those metaphysical uh -huh. implications, you know, that we talked about yesterday. All right, so now the Gemara says like this. Um, now that's Rav Nachman saying this about the case where the guys are kofar are kol. But Rav Chavivi teaches this on the end of the Mishnah. Manali biyadcha, you owe me a hundred dollars. I'm a lohein, yes. Lamachar malot teneoli, give it to me. Nesati v'lochai, I paid you up. Patua, you're exempt. So there he also is exempt by saying I totally paid you up. But there at least we know that initially he owed the money. Okay, and in that case, Rama Rav Nachman must be no social assessment. That's a case where the guy has to take a shvua. Okay, and now we understand that's a little different. That's a case where you start by knowing that there actually was a debt. Okay, and that's a little bit un more understandable that, that we can impose a shvua in that case. So, man if you can impose a shvua in the first case where there's absolutely no basis except this guy's claim, then of course you would apply it in the second case. Pretty much, a shvua assessment you could almost always apply. Right? Imagine any single court case i'm trying to get money from david whatever the case is if it's about torts if it's about a contract if it's about a million things so he said he said okay and therefore if david's denying and if i don't have evidence and david can walk off i can always say wait before you walk off make me make a shua assessment right it becomes almost this generic shua all right but in, according to the first version i almost don't even need to substantiate anything i just need to make the claim Okay, but man demasiwe a seifa. But if you say it only applies in the second case, top of memalafamalef, where there actually was evidence that there was a debt, and now the question was, was the debt paid off? So hachahu the ika drug de mamona. You would make sure when there is a drug de mamona. There's a whole major debated mm -hmm. on what exactly that means. But what? But it's basically understood to mean that there is basically some type of like I don't know shaychus mamona, meaning that there's clearly some um, substantiating. Um, basis you know it, it's clear that there was some uh, existing monetary obligation that exists you know that was present you know you already know that I have maybe the way to say this sort of like you already know that I have some legitimate claim on David's money now maybe that claim was addressed or maybe not but there's I already it's not like I'm coming out of the blue okay there's some connection I have to that money okay and therefore it has to be countered in the other case where there's no established connection to the money, lo, you would not you would not uh, take the extra essays. Now, what is the halacha? Michael always wants to know what the halacha is, because obviously if you don't even need a draw to Ramona, right, you can use this left and right, you can use this any single time. Okay, so take a look at Tosfos. Um, we, we, we haven't ruled one way or the other. So, if there's not already some established basis that the guy has some claim, so it's almost like normally we say, I can't take money out of you without proof, but I also can't extract a shvua from you without proof. Okay? If there's a debate whether I'm entitled to impose a shvua, do we impose a shvua when there's no draw de mamona, when it's just a claim out of the blue? So Tosa says, if there's a debate about whether you can do it, you can't do it. The same way if there's a debate about money, I can't make you pay if there's a debate. If there's a debate if I can demand a shvua from you, I can't make you take a shvua. The Afa so that's what Rabbeinu Tam said, okay? And nevertheless, mm -hmm. Apparently, judges liked to use it, right? You can imagine why judges like to use it. They figure it'll get people to tell the truth more. It'll... It, 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 it clears the, clears it'll, the jury system. It'll solve their conscience. They'll be able to feel that if we're passing to let the guy free, and he said what he said was a shrua, we feel better about it, okay? And then he says, "V'ktsas nira lahashbiya." So says it actually makes sense. We should do it, even cases where there's no drug of mamona. Tika da'amri tafel ulashem rishon. It's a good, important halachic principle. The Gemara says the first version was Rav Nachman said it on the first part of the Mishnah, even when there was no basis, just stama claim. Ika da Amri, he only said it when the guy admitted initially that he owed the money. So Tosh says an Ika da Amri always is considered to be less weighty than the first version. The first version of the events is always considered more to be the default interpretation. And since the first version was that Rav Nachman said it even without a draw to Mamona, we should rule that. Uh, don't we have okay. the Shambhatra usually, though? We have that comp yeah, yeah, that's that a call as well. Yeah, that's a quite it's a, good, it's a good question. Okay, that's why Tosos' next line is to Moshe Omer Riva. Okay, so there's that is a question about what is Lishnabastra the same as Nikita Amri mm -hmm. or not? Anyway, Mio, it's a very good question, which I'm not gonna 
unpack now. Mi Omer Beinu Tam Dazlina Basar Hamekio. That with an Igadam you go by the more lenient one. And now what's the more lenient one? The more lenient one is don't impose a shuva. Okay. Now, anyway, da 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 da. Now, um, I want to read, keep on reading this one more, so you get a sense of what a drawer of Ramona is. And he says like this: There was a certain shepherd. Okay, that there was a case about a shepherd that every day they used to give him a certain amount of sheep, and then there was a claim about blah blah blah. Anyway, and they made him make a shuvah hesed. Okay, well, I'm skipping a little. The Hassam Nami, Ika Draru de Mamona, I'm about, I skipped like three lines. Okay, so anyway, there's a question about what constitutes, I probably shouldn't have gone into that without looking at it. But anyway, there's a question what constitutes Draru de Mamona. So if I know that every day I gave you, you know, this was a guy that we would every single day have watch our sheep. And the story was every day they had watch our sheep and they didn't trust this guy. Okay, and they always made sure that there were witnesses. And one day when they gave him the sheep to watch, the shepherd, and one day they gave him the sheep without witnesses, yes, at least right. that's what they claimed. And then they said, and then he said, hey, well, you didn't give me sheep today. So they made him take a Shuas Hesse's, okay? So the question is, is that a Shuas Hesse's with a, without a Gerard de Mamona or with a Gerard de Mamona? Hmm. Today, on Monday, there's no evidence that we gave you, that we gave him the sheep. But based on the pattern we've established for the last year, we give him the sheep on a daily basis. So, so, you know, so is that a drug or Mamona or not? So, so it says, Rabbein Tom says that can work with his approach that you need a drug or Mamona because even though there's no evidence today, all of the evidence around it substantiates the likelihood that they did give him the sheep. So that's an interesting question of what constitutes drug or Mamona. Anyway, drug or Mamona, okay, so the, the word Mamona means money. Right. Drug, there's a debate what it means, but the Rishon sort of say like a connection to the money. But you establish that you have some, it's not just a claim is out of the blue. You're, you know, there, there, there's some reason that, you know, you, you're establishing you have some connection to the money that you're How claiming. How do you get that from the word Gerard? Gerard, they say, it means like shaykhut, shay, shaykhut, I don't know. Okay. So um, I think of Sipur Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what to say. Okay. So anyway, so we have an interesting question about whether we say, how do we paskin? Do we paskin, um, you know, you need a Gerard de Ramona or not, um, and, you know, um, can you impose this Shuras Hesse? Now we want to understand what's the weight of this Shuras Hesse. And it was right to act, you know, the Gemara sort of speaks about all of the way we scare somebody before taking a shua because of the power of a shua sheker, but presumably that's not a question of the obligation. That's just taking a shua sheker, even if you take it out of basin, even if you just stop taking it on your own. It's just when it's in basin, we can put the fear of God into you. Okay, so what is the difference between these? Um, so the Gemara says like this: My ika bein shua do right to shua do rabbanon. What is what's the difference between these two shuas? Now I want to again clarify that this shua do rabbanon does not mean the shua do rabbanon we're going to see later of the small number of cases where you can take a shua and actually um, extract money from the other side. This shua do rabbanon specifically means shuas heses. What's I the difference? Between... You need to keep it all... well, okay, so Michael suggests something which I'll get back to. It's not what the Gemara says. My ika bein shua do right to shua do rabbanon. Ika bein ayu mefech shua. Reversing the shuah. Okay, so let's say I have to take a shuah, a shuah of a motor bimiktas, and I say, I don't want to take it. David, you asked, you, you, you said I owe you $100, I say I only owe you $50. I don't want to swear in the other $50. If you swear, I'll pay you. Okay, so that's mafchinan. Can I have the option of reversing it to the other side? I'll tell you what, you swear and then I'll pay you. So here it's saying, for a doraita, you can't. If I refuse to swear, then I can't make you swear. I just have to pay, period. Okay? If I'm not going to take the shua, I don't have a right to, to reverse it to either side. Take the shua or pay. But by the Durabanan, I can say, I don't want to. I want you to do it. Okay? So, wait a minute. Mar Baravati says, even by the right, you're entitled to you know, reverse it to the other side. But the other side can't object? No, so, no, no. I'd really rather you take it. <laughs> well, no, he can't. Meaning... The fact that if I don't take the shua, it has to it translates into paying. Okay. Then I could say, you know, I refuse to take the shua, and I will pay you if you'll swear. And if you say I won't swear either, then presumably we would both walk away. Mm -hmm. That's the chiddush of 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 of, 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 of meipach shua. Okay. So they could be both like both uncertain. And with good intentions. Yeah, but then it's a but 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 you would not you you don't obligate a shua. That's a question. Can you obligate a shua by a tanis suffolk? All our cases is that you're saying I definitely owe you the oh. money. If you're saying I think you might owe me the money, and I say uh, I, I I you know I, well, anyway, 
Then if you only say you think, okay, then it's interesting. Let's say you think, but there's an Eidecha that say, I definitely does. Or you say you think, and it's a Shonim case. So Kesson about a Shur by a tiny Shema we haven't dealt with, okay? So anyway, let's read this through, and then we'll sort of pull it all together, okay? So, but, but I'm sorry, Rebchina means you actually you have the absolute <coughs> right. You this. have the right to switch it to the other side. And the other and the other side has to then agree. And the other side either takes a shua or doesn't get paid, presumably. And lo mafchina means that no, if you're not prepared to take it, you pay. Okay. So in, in the right side, even though you have to swear, according to this opinion, it says you can s switch it around, then you can turn the tables on me. Then I have no recourse if I don't want it. If I'm demanding money of you. Right. Um, okay. Lumad ravashi da amar b'doraita sana mafchina. B'chrit ravamar ravashi that you also reverse it by the right. So if you can reverse both of them, what's the difference? Whether if the guy refuses to take the shvua, and now we're getting to the consequence of refusing to take the shvua, okay, if the guy refuses to take the shvua, will we basically go and seize his property as a result? Now meaning, that's meaning the consequence. Which, and you told me, I have a shvua of a murder mix, that's I say I refuse to swear. So we'll basically now go and seize my, my Chevy to pay for the remaining 50 bucks or whatever it is, okay? So will they seize my property to pay for the, for the amount that the shul was supposed to be about? That I've been downgraded. You used, used to drive a Ferrari. I know. <laughs> well, it's only 50 bucks now. Okay. So... Uh, okay. So, so now the question uh, is, Now this, though, makes it sound that, going back to the question we raised before, that if I refuse to take a Shuas Hesse, he I do owe you the money. Okay? But the court won't act on it. So that's an interesting middle position we didn't imagine. Okay? You, uh, David says, I owe you $100. I, I, I say to David, you owe me $100. And David says, no, I don't owe you a penny. Here, take a Shuas Hesse. David says, I refuse to swear. So what's the consequence of refusing to swear? So according to this, it's like the court says, David, you have to pay uh, Dove $100. We're not going to go ahead and seize it. If you do the right thing, you'll pay it to him. We're not going to actually send the sheriff after you. So that's like an interesting middle position, that the consequence of not doing issues essays is you owe the money, but the court won't back that up by sending you know, the sheriff after you. Okay? Um, so Rav Yosef says, One minute, but according to Rav Yosi, Rav Yosi says that by cases of like a rabbinic uh, type of a obligation, we also would go to the guys, seize the guy's property. So not, how do we know Rav Yosi says this? Because he says, That if a somebody who's not able to take legal possession of an object, finds an object on the street, okay, then it's considered theirs, but it's only considered theirs because of like Tarche Shalom, the nice, you know, the in order to make for a well-running society. They're, they're not legally the owners. Um, and Reb, and Reb, Reb Yossi Omer Gezel Gomor. No, actually, it, we are legally, it's rabbinic, but we're going to legally consider them the owners. Meaning, so if you went to a court and you said, who is the owners of this object? The, according to the first opinion, it would be, well, nobody owes the object, but we let we're, we're letting you know that person hold keep it because uh, you know for 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 for, for uh, you know for public policy reasons or whatever it is for the well running society. Was Rabbi Yossi says no, we rabbinically have decreed that that person owns it. Okay, it's still rabbinic, but it's considered his. So the Gemara says lemai nafkamin avamar of the gezel gomer midivrayim. It's rabbinically his. So they all agree, except one says the rabbis instituted that he owns it, and the other said the rabbis instituted that we shouldn't take it away from him, that like we should like you know treat it as if it's his, but not that legally he owns it. Okay, and the, so that so that seems like only a hair's breadth difference. So the Gemara says lemai nafkamin. What difference does that make? Lo tzio because according to Rabbi Yossi, since you're calling it really his, that means let's say somebody went ahead and and, and did snatch it out of the hand of this of this chayushat of the cotton that found it. So according to the first opinion, they would say, okay, that was just we were telling people you shouldn't. Okay, we never are legally saying that it was his. So the guy didn't listen to us. He violated that rule that you should you know you shouldn't take it away from them. But the the cotton has no legal recourse. Okay, whereas Rabbi Yossi says, no, legally we said it was the Kotans and he has legal recourse and he can get it back from that guy. Fine. 
So the Gemara now is globalizing, and Tosas doesn't understand why it's globalizing, because it really seems that that's just a local debate by how we treat the the mitzia, the, 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 the finding of an object, the, the, when a cheshat v'katan finds a lost object, right? That they debate, is it only a tikkun olam, or is it a uh, durabanan ownership? It doesn't, it's so, but it would seem like that everybody would agree that in the case where really the rabbis do award something to somebody, that we would back that up with, you know, and really lohotzi obedayonim, say that the courts would uh, protect that right. So the Gemara makes it sound like they're having some global debate. When something I- emerges from a rabbinic ruling or an obligation, according to the Chachamim, we don't back it up with the police. And according to Rabbi Yossi, we do back it up with the police. Okay, but Tosa says, why are we saying that? Everybody would agree we back it up with the police. The only point is that the rabbis are saying the cotton is not is not recognized as the legal owner, right? It's just that they didn't even award it to the cotton in that case. But okay, bracket that. So the, the Gemara is basically reading this debate as being a global one. The Gemara is saying is, if according to Reb Yossi, you back up rabbinic things with the police and they will actually come and take the money away, right, from the person who took it from the cotton, so then in this case about a Shuas Hesse's, if you refuse to make the shrua, even if it's only a rabbinically imposed shrua, we should back up that we should back up the shrua, and we should go ahead and uh, you know and 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 send the police after you and make you pay the money. All right. So the gemara says. So what would be the difference? Now I just want to pause again for a moment before we say that because there's still a big difference, right? It's one thing if we say the rabbi say the cotton owns this object. And then somebody stole it from the cotton. We're going to go and take it away from that person and give it back to the cotton. Because we direct the, the nature of what the rabbi said was we recognize the cotton as the legal owner. But when what the rabbi said was when I come to David and says he owes me a hundred dollars and David says he doesn't, that David has to take a shvua, we never said anything about the money. All we said was David had to take a shvua. So Meaning the big question about how do we know that if he refuses the shrua, he owe, rabbinically he owes me the money and therefore we're going to send the police after him. Fine, if rabbinically he owes me the money, we will send the police after him. But how do we, how do we know to say that? All we said was that he has to make a shrua. How do we know to say that if he doesn't make a shrua, then rabbinically he owes me the money, right? So that again, the Gemara is taken for granted. So the simple reading of the Gemara is, is that if you take a shuas hesse, if you refuse to take a shuas hesse, the same way if you refuse to take a shuas doraita, you actually owe the money to the person and we will send the police after you. Okay, so it's pretty pretty weighty. There's not a big difference anymore, right? We're going to go ahead and send the police after you. So, and you owe the money. So what is the difference then? The difference would be, let's say David is not able to take a shrua because he was known to be a goslin or he's known to be a person that takes false oaths. So now, what happens when you try to impose a shrua on somebody who can't impose it? So, in a doraita obligation, if David has to take a shrua moda benictus and he's not able to because he's, let's say, known to lie under oath, so in that case, afchinenle, shrua. We reverse it and we put it on the other side. So before the question was, does David have the right to reverse it? If David just doesn't want to, can he say, Dove, you take the shoe and you take it? Here the question is, not does he have the right to, if, he's, if it's not possible for him to take the shoe, what, what do we do then? So by the right that we say the other side takes the shoe and collects. But the Rabbanon, we would not go that far to say that if David can't do it, that then I'm go- then, 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 then I'm going to have the right to do it and take the money away from me. The takanta the takanta law of dinan, and we don't make a takana on top of a takana. Okay, so therefore, what we basically do is we say if David can't make it, then he gets off scot free. It's a little ironic yeah. because David is a known to, known to swear falsely. He gets off the hook by a shuas hesses. Okay, so basically, so what have we sort of said? This is really a, an excellent gemara because besides identifying the difference between uh, the right and the Rabbanon, right? It basically tells you what happens by a shrua, different things about a shrua. So here's the case, okay? So you have to take a shrua. Now, here are some scenarios. I don't want to, okay? That's one scenario. Okay, now that could break up in two. You, one is like, you take it, okay? And you take it and then you'll win, right? And whatever. And I'll pay. You take it, and I'll pay. Okay, that's a case of 
of, of maple syrup. Then you reverse it to the other side. Okay. Another scenario is I just don't want to, and period. Not you take it, I'll pay. I don't want to. I refuse. Right. So what's the consequence if I refuse? Okay. So a consequence. So okay. And the other is I can't take it. Right. Which is the case about Hush. Okay. So what's the consequence there? All right. So. Yes. So, okay, so if this is right, the right, uh, this is, this is whatever, just Hesse. Okay. So, make sure, can you do this? Um, I didn't give myself a lot of room there. Anyway. All right. So if the guy says, I don't want to, you take it and I'll pay. Okay. So one says, by Shuas Hesate, what was the first to answer? Bidorbanan Mebuchud, right? So according to one, it's no, it's like, no, no, the, the, the nitva just pays. You know, Tovea doesn't have to. Have to, and the nitva pays. Right? That that's Loma Fchinan. And this is just Tovea has to. Okay, so that that's what that was the first answer. The guy says, "I don't want to. You take it, and I'll pay." According to one answer, that in this case, you don't have to. You don't have to take the shul. You, just, you you know the other side just pays without the shul. This is no. You're allowed to put it on the other side, and they do have to take the shul. Okay. The other I'm, I'm not sure if this is the other case is he's just refusing to take it all together. Okay. Then you know so and so in this case, pay. And we send the police. That's not seen on the Send the police. Okay, in this case, it's pay, but we don't send the police. I thought we said we do send the police. Okay, that, I mean, right, the Gemara then rejected that. The Gemara yes. says maybe we do even in that case uh -huh. as well. I'm just saying the Gemara was suggesting these uh -huh. as points of difference. Okay, and then in this case, I can't take it. Okay, so in this case, pay. I just need to do this. I'm a little bit. I just did, gave, didn't give myself enough room here. Okay. Anyway, fine. This is Doraita and this is Hesse. Okay. So in this case, okay, let's start with this. The guy refuses, right? So in both of these cases, it's basically it's pay. If the guy refuses, but the question is, do we send the police? Police check, and here we'll do it like this way. Police question mark, right? That was the question, okay? But in both cases, he doesn't want to pay. In this case, you take it and I'll pay, okay? So the question was, here, everybody agrees that basically um, that, that you know, Tovea takes Shvua and collects. And here the question is, does the Tovea even have to take the Shvua? Okay, maybe you're not allowed. Maybe the Tovea can say, "I refuse to take the shul. Pay me anyway. You're not. You're not taking it." Okay, so Tovea, we don't know if the Tovea has to. Okay, so can you reverse maybe. a biblical? Uh... That's the question. We the Gemara had a debate. Maybe okay. it doesn't have to. Okay. Okay, and then this case, I can't take it. Here, basically, the answer is pay, and here the answer is don't pay. Right. So if you want to give somebody a chance who you know is suspect, you're taking a double uh, uh, jeopardy there because he won't you won't be able to impose an oath on him. Um, uh, correct. Yeah. That is correct. That would be really stupid of you. <laughs> Collects and Shavua is a question mark. Okay. All right. So. Let's take a look. I hope that's that clarified it somewhat. Anyway, um, so now the Gemara says like this: Ula um, Banan uh, says the Gemara de pligali drebiosi damu bedor banan lo nachtinu lo nechse. So now the Gemara is choosing to read this as a you know as a big global debate that the rabbis would say we never back up our things with sending in the police. So according to them, that you don't send in the police right so basically he refuses to take it and we say you pay but we're not going to send in the police if that's true 
How do we get him to pay if he refuses to take the shula? We put him in cherem. Okay. So Amalei Ravina Ravashi. So Ravina said to Ravashi, Ha nakte bekuv se dinish bekei leglimehu. So that is Rashi says that this is a little bit of a crude expression. You're holding him by his blank. Okay, <laughs> I'll let you figure it out by the thing that is suspending from his body is what Rashi says the word kufse means. Okay, in order for and, and getting him to give you his cloak. Okay, yeah. so basically, very nice that you didn't send in the police by putting him in cherem. You're using pretty darn, you know, pers- uh, 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 you're basically forcing him through social pressure. You know, at the end of the day, it's just the same thing. Elamai of Dina lay fine. What do we do to him? Amalei Misham Tina lay Adamatizman Adamatizman Nagde. We fine. We don't put him in Cherem indefinitely. We put him in Cherem until the point where he deserves lashes. Because the halacha is somebody who's in Cherem and doesn't do something to rectify it for 30 days, we rabbinically give the person lashes. So we keep him in Cherem for 30 days, and then we give him lashes. And then Vishav Tina lay, and then we we, 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 we release him from his Cherem. So it's like a one month, you know, throw him in jail for contempt of court, but then he gets freed eventually. And if he's willing to undergo that, then we'll do that and he won't have to pay. Okay. So there, so there is the big difference. Therefore, I think this, right, the whole point here, right, is, I mean, the case of Chashud is an unusual one, but the real question that this is asking is, how weighty is this shrua obligation in the sense of will it ever translate into paying money if it's only this rabbinic shrua? Okay? And the basic point is, yes, we do want you to pay money even for this rabbinic shrua, but we're just not going to force it to the same degree. Okay? We might not send the police after you. We'll still try to pressure you to pay. That's what's being debated. Okay? Maybe we won't make you pay unless the other guy will take the shrua, whereas in a doraita, maybe even if the other guy doesn't take the shrua, we'll make you pay. All right? So now the Gemara says like this. Um, now, by the way, um, you know, uh, there's uh, uh, M- Michael was here. He said maybe the Gemara is sort of talking about the legal ramifications of the differences. But the question also is is there a difference in terms of how we, the ritual of taking the Shrua? Because when we started this parak, we all spoke about, you know, using God's name and taking, holding onto an object and um, like a Sefer Torah. So if you look at Tosos, he says, um, so he he quotes Rashi saying, "My ika ben shuah deraisa the shuah derabanan perka kosei rebe gabe had the amar of nachman ipikech shimon meisile the day shuah deraisa pirush pekunches did not come in but the deraisa by lemitat cheftsa biyade derabanan lo boy." Okay, he says that Rashi says the difference is that in the ritual is that by a deraisa you hold on to a sefer Torah. But by Yeshua's Hesseis, you're not going to have to hold on to a Sefer Torah or Tefillin. And Rambam says the same thing. Rambam says that by Yeshua's Hesseis, the uh, officer of the court who's imposing the oath holds on to the Sefer Torah, but the person taking the oath does not hold on to the Sefer Torah. Tosus disagrees. Tosus says, no, that's the, the, the ritual is the exact same. Okay, so that, there's an interesting question there, which is, is there a difference in the ritual of the Shua Sesate? That the Shua Sesate, maybe we don't insist you hold on to a Sefer Torah. All right, so that's that issue. All right, so now the Gemara says like this. Um, uh, now let's continue. Amar of Papa, Haiman Dafik Shtar al Chavre, the Amar Lay, Shtar Paruhu, somebody who basically, so now, Rather than me just saying David owes me hundred dollars and he denies it, I actually extract an IOU that said that you know a, a written document with witnesses that said that David owed me a hundred dollars. And David says, "Yeah, I paid it up already. You you know you were supposed to give it back to me." Okay. Okay. We say, "Yeah, we don't believe you. Obviously, you're not believed to say you've paid it up if the guy's holding on to a star." But if David says, fine, I'll pay him because he's got a star. You know, I totally lose in this case, right? That's that's like, this is the exact reverse of a kofar kol. A normal kofar kol is I come with no evidence and David says, I don't owe and David should be able to walk away, but maybe we make him make a shuas heses. Here, I come with the big guns. I've got a star. And David says, I don't owe you. And David is completely not believed, okay? But here's what's going to happen. If David then says, David says, I want Dove to take a shua to me before I pay him. Okay, fine. It's the reverse case. Here, the other case I was going to win, I was going to walk away, and you said, make a shua before I walk away. Here, Dove is going to get his hundred dollars. Let him take a shua before he takes his hundred dollars. Okay. Amina lay ishtavale. We say to him, yeah, Dove, take a shua to him. Okay, so this sounds like a different version of a shua's hesse's. But what's funny here is that like I'm like backed up with a whole star. Okay. 
And um, nevertheless, okay, I'm going to have a braid of Ravashi. Ma bein zel the pogi misrstaro. How is that different? One of the rabbinic cases of a shvua is a case where actually David, um, where actually I admit that the star has been partially paid. David says, I say, David, pay up this $100 you owe me. And David says, I paid it all back. And I say, you didn't pay it all back. You paid back 20 bucks. You still owe me the other 80. So I've already admitted he paid me 20. So once I've already admitted that the star is not exactly, like it's not pristine, I've been pogaming it. I've like injured the star. I've conceded that part of it is paid. That raises questions. Oh, he paid 20. Maybe he paid the whole thing. That case, the rabbis insisted I made a shvua. So now we're saying, but you're telling me even with the star has not been, you know, uh, somehow impinged upon, right? That you can go ahead and be obligated to make a shvua. So every time a guy takes out a star, you have to make a shvua. And why, why do we make a specific takana that in the case of Pogang Staro, where he concedes it's partly been paid, he has to make a shvua. If you're telling me he always has to make a shvua. Uma bein zela pogim is staro. Amrlei hasam afagov de lo tain iu tanin amrlei. In a case where I conceded that some of it had been paid, then even if David doesn't ask for a shrua, we in the court are going to say, Dove, you can't collect the rest until you make a shrua. Okay? Here we say to David, we don't suggest it. We say to David, David, Dove's got the star, go pay. And if David says, wait, 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 I want him to make a shvua, then I mean, then we say, go ahead and make a shvua. Okay. So yes, this requires David to make the demand. Now, um, you know, this is also interesting, right? Because like, does this show evidence about like how ready we are to make a shvua's hesse? You know, here I've got a star backing me up. And David could demand that I like, you know, take a shuas hesed or so on. So, or take take some type of a shuas. So part of the reason is, as Tosos points out, I won't really go into the whole Tosos, but he points out, you know, it's because we also know the same way we know in the other case that sometimes David says he doesn't owe me money and he does, he's only pushing me off. We also know in cases of a star that it's often the case that I still have a star even if it's been paid up. Right, that I haven't gotten around to returning it to David. That I said, David, you know, that, that David used to owe me the money for the cost of the sofa to write the star. I'm not going to give you the star as evidence that you paid your debt until you pay the sofa and the money that we owe. That, you know, his still outstanding bill. You know, there are cases where cases off. There are frequent enough cases where the debt's been paid up and the star hasn't been returned. It just is, and therefore that allows us to say that this case as well, if a shrua is demanded, we'll make a shrua. It doesn't say what happens if the guy refuses to make the shrua, right? That's always the question. He still has a star behind him. You know, would he be able to collect? I don't know, presumably yes, but it's not clear. Okay, so now the Gemara says like this. Um, okay. But if, here, Dove here, I'm trying to collect with my star, I'm a Talmud Chacham, then I don't have to take a Shrua. Now that's very interesting, right? Because it's sort of like you're impugning my um, my integrity and my honesty by telling me that we're not going to believe you, you have to make a Shrua. Now normally, we don't say a Talmud Chacham is exempt from that, okay? Because normally we're talking about a Shrua derives, or whatever type of a Shrua we're talking about. We never mentioned Talmud Chacham before, right? If somebody says, I owe $100, and I say, Yes, I do, but I paid it up or whatever. We say I have to take a shuas hesed. We say, oh, don't take it if you're a common chacham. God forbid we would impugn your integrity. Okay, but here it's a little different. Here I've got a star backing me up. So if I've got like a heavy evidence backing me up, you know, in that case, we'll waive the need of a common chacham to take a shvua. You know, maybe not in other cases where there's no good evidence or whatever. But here, where I've got this serious evidence. We don't want to demand a shvua from you. You're a Talmud Chacham. It impugns your integrity. And anyway, you've got a star backing you up. We'll give you a pass. Okay, so just because we're giving you a pass here doesn't mean we're giving you elsewhere. But that's what the Gemara says. Amalei, but, but the Gemara doesn't like this. Amalei Rav Yemar, Rav Ashi, Glima de Inchi? I don't get it. A Talmud Chacham has a right to basically strip people of their cloaks. You know, like, I, just because he talked, like, how can you show this type of a favoritism? It gets back to earlier questions we had. Remember about the Adim and the Balidin, and does one stand and one sit if it's a Talmud Chacham? Like, do you, do you show any difference in a court? People say, oh, so because he's a Talmud Chacham, he goes, he's able to go ahead and, uh, you know, win the case without having to take a shrua. Everybody else takes a shrua. Like, so he just is able to rob people. That's not fair. 
So Ella, so the Gemara says, Lomi's Dakinan Leiladine. Now, this is even a worse conclusion, which is, okay, you're right. We can't give him, he doesn't have to take a shua. That introduces a real unfairness into the system, makes it look like he's taking advantage of people. On the other hand, we can't ask him to take a shua that impugns his integrity. So you know what we're going to do? We'll just never ha hear his case. We'll always delay his case. We'll let, you know, he never gets a hearing in court. So it's crazy. I, I, what does that mean? I've got a star that David owes me ten thousand dollars, right? I mean, a lot of Kamidei Chachamim actually were in the business of money lending, although that was to non-Jews. Anyway, I've got a star. David owes me ten thousand dollars, and he says, "Take a shvua," and the court will never hear my case. Like, really? <laughs> like, how does that work? Anyway, that seems to be the conclusion of the Gemara. We're punishing him for being. I know it's Instead crazy. Productive. It's crazy. <laughs> like so, like the other guy, we were rewarding the guy right. that was the chashur, and we're right. punishing the guy that's the Talmud Chacham. Okay. Manali biyadcha. Okay. So now the guy says, you owe me a hundred dollars. He says, yeah. He says, no, I don't. He's exempt. Then he says, yes, I do. Then he says, I paid it. So if he says I paid it, he's actually believed. But if he says, but if he says, don't pay me except with witnesses. And then he says he paid it. He's not believed. Amar of Yudamaravasi. If you lend money with witnesses, the guy has to pay back and with witnesses. Now, the question is, does it just mean witnesses have to be present? Or what it also probably means is that it's implicit that he won't be believed to say he paid back unless he can produce witnesses. If I had witnesses present when I lent you the money, then implicit is any claim you made that you've reimbursed me will not be believed with, unless you can produce witnesses. Um, I said to and Shul and Amr and said to me, No, you don't either you don't have to pay back with witnesses at all, or even if you do have to pay back with witnesses, you can always claim that they were that, that, that you had witnesses and they're not here anymore. Which means bottom line is whether the act of paying back needed witnesses, even if you lend money, according to Shmuel, even if you lend somebody money money with witnesses, they are believed to say they paid you back without producing. Okay, that's the point of Shmuel. Now, Tna, this really seems to be in our Mishnah. Our Mishnah says, Manali biyatcha, Amr you owe me a hundred dollars. Yes. And presumably, yes in front of witnesses. To be a, a proven yes. Lamach Amr lo give it to me. Nasati v'lach I gave you. Patur, you're exempt. So, ha, 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 in this case, even the Tavi be'edim, since there were witnesses when he said you owe me the money, and he admitted to it. Command the Ozve be'edim done. Presumably, it's exactly analogous to lending the money with the witnesses. Viktani Potter, and it says that you're believed to say you paid back, you don't have to produce the witnesses. It sounds like Shmuel. Shuf to the Ravasi, that's a contradiction of Ravasi. So, Amalekha Ravasi, Ravasi would say to you, Anaki Amri Hecha de Mekara Ozve be'edim, the lowly day hemne. No, no, no. I only said that you need to produce witnesses that you pay back if initially the money was given to you with witnesses, which then it was clear, like, I don't believe you at the outset. Anything I'm going to do with you, David, we are going to have it fully documented and witnesses are going to be present, etc. Then I'm making it, I'm clearly telegraphing that I do not believe you, yet I don't trust you, and the only way you can believe there's any claim against me is by producing witnesses. Um, uh, here, when I initially lent you the money, I did it without witnesses. So in that case, even though there were witnesses around when you admitted to the debt, that does not mean you still implicit in our original transaction was that you would be believed to say, was that you would not need to produce witnesses to believe to say you paid back. Okay. Rav Yosef Masni Hachi. So that's, this is how Rav Yosef teaches it, the, the discussion. I'm Rav Yudam Ravasi, Hamavaz Chaver Be'edim Yenotarach Lefar O Be'edim, that actually the initial statement was that e even the first statement was not before you get to Shmuel, that you don't have to pay back with witnesses. But, the Amar Alti for Eni Ele Be'edim, if he explicitly stipulates you must pay back with witnesses present, then you have to do it with witnesses. And again, presumably it means not just it has to be paid back, but witnesses have to be produced to prove it. So according to this, everybody agrees that if you don't stipulate, you're believed to have said you paid back. But if you stipulate, then of course you have to pay back with witnesses. You have to produce the witnesses. Kiamrise coming to Shmuel. So when I said this to Shmuel, Amrli, Yachalomerlo, Pratika Bifne Ploni, Ploni, Vachalam, Dina Sayam. That Shmuel says, maybe if he stipulates you have to pay back with witnesses, you do have to pay back with witnesses. But you don't have to produce the witnesses to prove it. You can basically say, sure, I paid you back with witnesses and they're not here anymore. Okay, so for Shmuel, pretty much, unless you're really explicit and you say, 
don't pay me back without witnesses, and you're not believed to claim you paid me back until you can produce the witnesses. Unless you sort of spell all that out, according to Shmuel, any condition, fine, it's just a condition of how it has to be paid, but now it has to, not how it has to be proven. So let's see what the Mishnah indicates. Um, uh, it's not. Uh, we learn turn our Mishnah. Manuli biyadcha. I'm alohein. Yes, I'm alohein. I'll teach neuli ela beeden. This is our Mishnah. Only pay me back with witnesses. Um, I'll teach neuli ela beeden. Uh, ela bifne eden. Lemachar malo teneuli. Give it to me. And he says, Nesati v'lech I gave it to you. Chayev nishutarich li kim malo beeden. He has to give him witnesses. And presumably, what that means is, is that he's even if he if he can't prove it, he's chayev. Presumably, even if he said, I gave it to you in front of witnesses and they're no longer here, the Mishnah sounds like tough luck, buddy. If you can't produce the witnesses, that's a simple sense of the Mishnah. If I said only pay back with witnesses and you can't produce them, you're chayev. So that seems to go against Shmuel. Shmuel says you don't have to actually produce them. So it's yuf to the Shmuel. It's a contradiction to Shmuel. Amel Shmuel. Shmuel will say to you, Tanoihi, you know what? It's true. That Mishnah goes against me. That Mishnah assumes you have to produce them. I don't think you have to produce them. But it's a debate of Tanayim. Tanya, we turn to Brisa. The Aidim Hil Visicha, if I say I lent you money with witnesses, the Aidim Parali, and therefore I expect you to pay me back with witnesses. So, O Yitain, O Yavi Raya, Shinasan. So, therefore, in that case, so if I make it clear that you have to pay me with witnesses, then you either pay me now or bring evidence that you paid me back. Meaning that's the idea that you have to produce the witnesses. If I say pay me with witnesses, they have to be produced. That's the idea of our Mishnah. Our Mishnah said, if you said you paid me, you're not believed. You have to produce the witnesses. If I demanded that there be witnesses. But Rabbi Yehuda ben Betera Omer, now Rabbi Yehuda ben Betera says like Shmuel says, No, I paid you and they went away. So basically, here you have, it's a debate of Tanayim, and it's a debate of Amorayim, whether if I say pay me back with witnesses, does that mean the witnesses have to be present at the time of paying? Only that's how Shmuel reads it in a very narrow sense, but then you can claim later that they were there and they went away. Or does it mean no, no, no what we would all assume it means? No, 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 you have to produce the witnesses if you want to actually be believed, and that's the assumption our mission makes. What was okay. the point of even allowing that? Because uh, why would you make the original uh demand if somebody can just say they went away? They, they went away, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I agree, like you might, you know. I mean, that's presumably the logic. Why else would you make this stipulation if the claim right. just, I mean, the point is, is that, you know, it, it's harder to make that claim. You don't, you know, you don't look, people suspect you when you're saying things like that. Then I say, okay, who are they? Let, tell me their names. Well, well, let's try to go run after and get them. You know what I mean? It does create certain pressures, but it's not, but yes, it's clearly the logic is that if I'm demanding witnesses, I, I mean, I want them to be able to, I, we need them to testify. So let's just finish up to the two dots here. Parach Rav Acha, Rav Acha asked. Now, by the way, there's a Tosos that says whenever it says Parach Rav Acha, it is referring to the Rav Acha Gaon, the author of the Sheiltot, um, who, um, and this is really like a later insertion in the Gemara. This was not actually initially part of the Gemara. There's a Tosos that discusses Parach Rav Acha's. Parach Rav Acha, mimai dibashas how do you know when I say, pay me up or, you know, either, you know, he says, I lent you with money, pay me back with money. What's, we've read that, that that meant when the guy was lending the money, he was saying, you know, you have to pay me back with witnesses. I said, pay me with money, I meant witnesses. Anyway, you have to pay me back with witnesses. Who says that transaction and that brighter was talking about what was said at the time of the loan? The Yom Abishas Tviyakai. Maybe it's, it was talking about was at the time of when the money was being demanded. Did I not lend you with witnesses? So meaning the Brita doesn't, when the Brita says, you have to pay me back with witnesses, and Shmuel said, ah, there's a debate whether that means you have to actually produce the witnesses. Rabbi Rav Acha here is saying, the Brita wasn't clear that that stipulation was made at the type of the loan. It might be happening that at the loan, no stipulation was made. And later the guy is saying, why aren't you paying me back with witnesses? I, when I lent you, I lent you with witnesses, but not that he actually ever stipulated. Okay, and in that case where it wasn't stipulating, they're debating whether you have to produce witnesses. Although Bishasava, I could claim in that right though, that if the stipulation was explicit at the time of the loan, okay, maybe everybody would say you're chayev. 
And the, he doesn't have an answer. So Shmuel has this brighter that says, look, in this brighter, there's a debate if you have to produce witnesses. And what and therefore that's the side that says you don't have to is my side. And now the Gemara is saying, maybe that brighter was only talking about when nothing was stipulated at the time. But maybe if something is stipulated at the time, maybe everybody agrees you have to produce witnesses. All right, so we're still left as open-ended. Shmuel says, you don't have to produce witnesses. They, you, you might have to claim that they were there, but you don't have to produce them. And the Stam understanding is if you stipulated that there needs to be witnesses, it means they need to be produced. Okay, let's just again, just wrap up. I'm sorry, taking a few more minutes, but we, let's just wrap up. Um, okay. Um, I'm a Papi. So said Rav Papi. Yes, if there were witnesses, then there at the time, then you have to pay back with witnesses. That's the most demanding of the positions. No, no, no. If there was no stipulation, then you don't have to pay back with witnesses. That's generally the assumed sock to our shas. If you lend, even if there were witnesses at the time of the lending, without any stipulation, you don't need to produce witnesses. But how about the other point, which was the big debate? Don't pay me without witnesses. Sarich lefaro beid, and then you need obviously. Im amar lo praticha bifnei ploni ploni v'halchul am v'dina sayan. Now this question, Shmuel's claim that you can say there were witnesses, but I'm not going to produce them. Then our version is nema. Your belief, ruling like Shmuel, very very lenient. But if you look at the side, the side says the Rambam's girsa is ain't on them. <laughs> so exactly, we, you know, if Michael was here, he'd be so excited. We're actually ruling. But then the key question, how do we rule? Depends what girsa you have. Certainly the thrust of the Gemara and the logic, as David says, if the guy says, don't pay me back except with witnesses, presumably you got to produce the witnesses. It's not enough to claim that they were there. Okay. And certainly that's the evidence, the shot of our mission. But Shmuel says you don't have to produce them, and it's not clear in the end how the Gemara rules on that point. Okay, we will end with this.